How you going guys? So this is officially my first episode abroad. I wish I could do it with the boys, but obviously I've got to make do with what I have. So this episode is with my friend Sumbul Mohammed. He's from Istanbul. Um, so how we met, just to give a little backstory before the episode starts, is that we met from a farmhouse about half an hour from Granada. So I found out about this opportunity about volunteering there. We were staying over there at the farmhouse for about three days. And obviously we exchanged stories, got to know each other a bit, and also stayed with me in Granada for a bit. So this was the chance where I got to interview him, speak about his travel experiences life lessons and also learning learning English from like 18 years old which changed his life so it's a great it's a great story he's got and also very interesting to see what else he can do in the future you guys will enjoy this one so peace then something clicked on my mind I was like um, this is gonna be something I need to learn a lot hmm. so many things if you are eager to learn there is a lot to learn and then Another thing when I, this, in my opinion, this was a kind of stereotype somehow was built in my maybe subconscious being not, not being able to feel comfortable with different people, mm. even though they are Muslim, like we are Muslim, we all are Muslim, right? Let alone from different religions yeah. and stuff. Sumbul, salam alaikum bro. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Welcome to the podcast. It's, it's a pleasure. pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here with you, with Fair Dinkum. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I'm from Australia. Yes. It's my first time having being a guest on the podcast of Australian Brothers. Alhamdulillah. That's good. Uh, I believe it's going to be a very nice podcast. Inshallah. It took a while for organizing this. We planned to initially plan to do it at the local mosque, but then we forgot a chord and Alhamdulillah. Now it's becoming to a sudden episode. Alhamdulillah. So it's good. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So what we do, since it's your first time on the podcast, what we do is we have icebreaker questions for our guests. So Bismillah, I gave you some time. I told you this morning what the question is going to be. Okay. The question is, if you could meet anyone <laughs> dead or, or alive, who would it be? Okay. Let me think. And be able to have a conversation. With That's it. a very nice question. <clears throat> I think that would have been Mehmed II, okay. as we know Fatih Sultan Mehmed in Ottoman history. Yes. The, the one of the best sultans of the Ottoman Empire, the one who conquered Istanbul. Hmm. And Constantinople became Istanbul after. The reason why I feel like Fatih Sultan Mehmed, as we say, as Western say Fat Mehmed II hmm. is because of his courage. When he conquered Istanbul, he was 21 years old. Mashallah. Then we always grow up with this history, you know, and this was given us as an example all the time. What you want to do when you turn 21? Are you gonna become a new Fatih? So are you gonna open new doors? So maybe we were not able to conquer Istanbul, but I believe that each single one of us, one way or another, try to serve the community we are in somehow and try to become the Fatih of the communities, inshallah. Inshallah, I love that. It shows that <clears throat> age is just a number and you can still make a big impact from a young age. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so let's start from, let's start from the very beginning. So let's just talk. So as people can hear by accent, mashallah, you're, to, you're from Istanbul. So let's just explain where you're from, where you, where you were raised as well. And okay, all that. Uh, I'm 24 years old. I'm originally half Georgian, half Circassian. And I was born and raised in Istanbul for a while. I lived in Istanbul for six years, then I moved to a city in Anatolia, which was quite an, a, a small town. Alhamdulillah, my, pro, my family uh, got a chance to send me good school, so I had a chance to get good education. But even if you have a good education, you're in the middle of Anatolia in a small town and things are limited. I grew up with, I, f, I, I grew up with a uh, foreign language, for example. Hmm. It was, for us, it was not that important. It was because we live in a small city. It's because we also Turks are, a bit maybe 
the nationalism we have in our blood. Hmm. We are not very happy to learn another language at first place. And I was, Alhamdulillah, I can't repay my back. I can't repay my family. They have done so much for me. But at the end of the day, you are in a small circle and even if you try to explore new things within yourself, it's limited, right? The opportunities mm. are limited. It's not about, it's not about money mm. because the environment you are in does not provide you certain things, even in education at some certain point. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I was quite, my upbringing was like, it was very hard for, to manage with me as my, like my, mm. my parents struggle a lot. Okay. I was very hyperactive and it was really hard for me to concentrate on my classes. Alhamdulillah, I was a successful student, but it was for me, especially learning and language or so, so other things was very hard because it needs lots of concentration. You need to sit, mm. you need to focus, learn a lot. And I'm someone who likes learning things very fast. I, I don't have the summer. I didn't have back then. Oh, okay, yes. O over the time, life somehow, you know, you're going through a different tasks mm, and challenges and you sure. learn how to be patient. But I was in a, an environment that which was not very diverse. Okay. And growing up with just uh, one language, like not so many different people from different ethnicities or backgrounds. So for me, the way I see the life was just literally like a one way road because you don't see the other ways hmm. you see the culture is this the food is this the things you do the the custom everything is like somehow not intentionally but unintentionally is imposed to you hmm. so this was how my life was till the age of 18 then i when i passed my high school exam and i got into university then another journey started in my life Okay, Basically. so yeah. let's talk from this journey because, um, mashallah, you have very good English, but people don't know when your English journey started and how long it's been till now. So where did it start? Okay, so if I get into this topic, <laughs> I need to start from the very, very beginning because I was not interested in languages because my family, you know, I'm coming, my, my, my roots are like very diverse, Circassian roots, Georgian roots. My grandparents used to speak to each other and to my parents in Georgian and okay. they tried to teach us. But I was very, very, you know, uh, stubborn to learn. I was yeah. like, I don't want to learn. And back then I remember, may Allah bless my father. He brought yeah. us a like bunch of DVDs and he got us a DVD player from like, you know, BBC's English classes. And oh, he brought wow. us home, he put us in front of TV. He was like, you're gonna watch every day, grammar, this, this and that, you should learn. It's very important to learn the language. This was like in 2004. And so your dad speaks English or he just encourages he, he wanted to encourage us because yeah. when he was in university, he somehow learned, but he didn't have a chance to progress. Yeah. Then he wanted us to, you know, the parents always want, but Alhamdulillah, he didn't force, but he tried to, but I was mm. not interested at all. Yeah, it's not easy then to start. Even though he bought us so many DVDs and stuff. He encouraged us in a very good way. My grandparents used to speak in Georgian. Okay. Like we had a chance to go to Georgian language school, but I didn't learn. <clears throat> when I came to university, and the only English I speak was, my name is Muhammad Sumbul. Uh, I am or I am coming or I am come. Is it ING or come? Mm. I was like that, you yeah. know, like I didn't know. I didn't know at all. One day, I give you the background story. So, you know, I was like, the, the way I see the life was like one way. Hmm. So this might be, this is gonna, in a, in a way you're gonna connect the dots. Okay. Like um, the language, culture, every single thing. I remember it was a kind of like a turning, breaking point in my life. When I was in the university first, I went to Masjid. I was studying in a very secular university. Uh, we didn't have a proper masjid. The masjid we have was a kind of a room, very small room outside of university. I went there, there was one brother praying. Then I start praying. I think he was making dua. I start praying and he touched my shoulders and he start following me. 
for the first time I'm seeing someone is coming sitting next to me because normally I'm Hanafi he's coming from different mashab so maybe the way we follow you know I did I've never had hmm. met a people from okay. like Muslims from different mashab let alone like different backgrounds because like, your whole your whole town yeah. in Turkey where you raised from is like all yeah, Hanafi all Hanafi yeah and imagine I, I was praying like this, he was praying like this, he touched my shoulder, he didn't even have a distance next to me, he just literally prayed next to me. I felt very different, I was like, I felt very stressed, hmm. then when someone prayed next to me, like, in a way, like, in different way, back then I couldn't feel it, you know, like, I, I felt like very different. And then we finished the, the, the Salah, then we start having a conversation. Then with my broken English, I was trying to speak. I struggle a lot. But Alhamdulillah, the only thing I remember like Taqabbal Allah, hmm. Allah accept our prayer. And I, I felt this, uh, you know, the sincerity from the brother. And he's now one of my closest friends. Alhamdulillah. Mahmoud, <laughs> Mahfoud from Kuwait. And then something clicked on my mind. I was like, um, this is going to be something I need to learn a lot. Hmm. So many things. If you are eager to learn, there is a lot to learn. And then another thing when I, this, in my opinion, this was a kind of stereotype somehow was built in my maybe subconscious. Being not, not being able to feel comfortable with different people, hmm. even though they are Muslim, like we are Muslim, we all are Muslim, right? Let alone from different religions yeah. and stuff. And the first time after this one, the five months later, and I went to Umrah, alhamdulillah. Then, you know, some people can relate it to Malcolm X stories. His, his story was mm. the way when he went to Hajj, the pilgrimage, this like the black and white, all the Muslims are together, coming together. There is no superiority. Everyone is equal and everyone is very warm to one another. Mm. And when I went to Umrah, maybe not exactly the same story, but I saw like different Muslims from different backgrounds, from east to west, from north to south, different colors, different backgrounds, different mm. languages. Like literally, no one looks one another, like everyone looks completely different. The way they pray, the way they praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the way they, everything is similar but different and i i realized that the diversity the this different is a kind of baraka hmm. then all the startup in my mind i had was completely destroyed and you know changed that time alhamdulillah things start changing in my life then the guy who, in a way who was brought up in a very small city was i think getting into a new journey which was gonna end up in a very, very international environment. Hmm. MashaAllah, it just shows like the importance of like, get, not just getting outside your town, but even your country as well, meeting other people. And Alhamdulillah, like as Muslims, we can, we obviously we know that there are other Muslims around the world, but we need to meet them and on a personal level if possible like this alhamdulillah so it's good okay so your english study <clears throat> your english journey started about 18 years old and has it been up until this day or did you only study like part time because it's clearly changed your life alhamdulillah alhamdulillah i think there's also another point to mention the first year when i started to learn english i was in an english preparation school so my dad was like he he had so much expectation from me and which was motivating me in a way but which i realized was not healthy for me to learn a language mm. because i'm not the kind of person who likes sitting and learning things for the sake of learning like not to learn if i don't have a purpose why would i learn a language i yeah. tried i tried but it was just to pass the exams but the moment when i after all these things come together these dots connect with each other then i realized the le learning a new language english language this might be another language when you have a cause, when you have a reason, purpose to learn this, in my case, which was being connected with different people, especially with Muslims all around the world, mm. doing something together, serving the community, because in, otherwise the language was going to be the biggest barrier for us. Then Alhamdulillah, and the more I socialize, the more things I learn, like, and I didn't, at some point, I didn't even need to study. Mm. It became a part of my life and, you know, like, it's it's a uh, it's this is how it started actually yeah
Yeah, no, honestly, it's beautiful. It's good to see the process of learning languages. We we're talking about this this morning, the process of learning languages, because it's something I'm comparing to with learning Spanish now, because we're currently in Granada. And sometimes you can have so much, like it can be so important to you, but then that's where all the pressure is put onto it. And then you're not enjoying the time. You're not getting the chance to meet people and actually understand. So that's good. <laughs> So since you've now, alhamdulillah, you've learned English for a few years now, it's clearly opened many doors for you. Alhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah, so like volunteering, being able to travel a lot, and clearly like when I did meet you, you the, your level of traveling, mashallah, is like very impressive. Like this is a blessing from Allah as well. So alhamdulillah, where did it all start? First of all, as we said, like, you know, these are the things not from us. Hmm. Uh, I like quoting this ayah this is by the grace of my Lord whatever we are given in this life first of all they all are test I hope we always remember this starting from myself my nafs uh, but alhamdulillah these are good blessings and if you are aware of these blessings how getting back to your question how my journey started alhamdulillah so far when I went to Umrah, I think Umrah was a kind of a point in my life. Okay, yeah. I was in front of Kaaba and someone literally like pushed me from my back, like because it's so crowded. And mm. I found myself literally in front of Kaaba, touching mm. the Kaaba's, you know, yep. uh, wall. And I was like making dua. Ya Allah, help me to explore myself, explore the world meeting new people literally this was my intention because i felt so isolated the moment you know when i went to umrah and seeing like the world is big hmm. you know first when i was living in my city and i went to istanbul i was like life was not about my city like this is life is bigger than my city hmm. i came to istanbul oh the life is here then you start traveling you see oh life like the world is bigger than that yeah. and when you see the bigger picture you make to ah and i was like yeah like give me good opportunities hmm to also make good things and alhamdulillah after this point so far Allah blessed me to visit with like 45 countries uh, from east to west uh, met so many wonderful people wonderful Muslims like very very like nice people amazing people and alhamdulillah may Allah bless them all I learned so many things from them hmm. and mm -hmm. This is how my journey started actually like I think sometimes maybe the dua you get from someone sometimes the the goodness you make to someone is opening the door but at the end of the day one thing to keep in mind always it's not from your actions or like from yourself everything is from Allah's grace and mercy hmm. Amen Allah is the best of all planets yeah. So I want to know as well because it is not easy to also not just like um get the opportunity but then it's like making the time like your intentions for your travels the like one one thing is to go visit as a like you know just a holiday or vacation but another thing is to also go volunteer at a place get that local experience in a way True. so i want to know what's most of the like volunteering experiences that you've been through uh, like through is it through Islamic organizations is it basically the way I start traveling was I first start traveling with Umrah like the, the, the first time I was in abroad was when I went to Saudi Arabia hmm. then after that I realized that learning uh, learning English is a is a must for me hmm. otherwise it's gonna be a very very big barrier in front of me in my life <clears throat> then I decided to go to the UK but back then the economy now it's like let alone now it's like you know the crazy the, it's crazy Inflation. even back yeah. then the turkish economy was not that strong mm. and it was somehow like uh it was not that bad but it was still bad and i decided to go to the uk i researched about language school accommodations and stuff sorry <laughs> mm. I made my research about language school accommodations and stuff and I found a language school I found a, like a British family to stay with them then then I was just looking for a brother to meet you know just to if I if I need help or if I need to have a coffee with someone at least to socialize then alhamdulillah a friend of mine connected to someone and that brother from the UK his name is Dili 
he offered me his house. He was like, come and stay wow. with me. Instead of staying with a, like, you know, someone you don't know, a Muslim family, mm. come with, stay with us. It will be for your life, it would be easier. Instead of going to language school, come, you can learn with the native speakers. Because if you go to language school, you're gonna learn with the Italians, Japanese, like Chinese, yeah. like Spanish, different people who are also coming there to learn the language, who are not native. Then Alhamdulillah, I can't repay him. May Allah bless him, like this was the, how the door opened first. Hmm. Then I realized that I like learning new things, new languages, like I like meeting new people because from everyone you meet, there's always something to learn. And if you're also someone like socializing extrovert, and this opens so many doors because you go socialize with someone, there's another opportunity that they invite you. Long story short, I went back to Turkey and after a couple of months, my, I was to be honest, it, it might be a criticism to myself. I think I was not grateful enough for the things I have in my life, hmm. for the family I have, for the finance. I'm not coming up, I'm not coming from a very wealthy family. I'm coming from a middle class family. Alhamdulillah, my family provide me enough for my education, for my, you know, for my livings and stuff. Hmm. But one thing when I look at back now, I realize is that I was not grateful enough. And my, my dad was telling me, sometimes I, you know, the, the, the child, when he doesn't get the things he wants, he cries, 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 <laughs> like, yeah. you know, being very naughty. Hmm. I think I was that child. Not that naughty, but yeah. in a way, I was not grateful. <laughs> one thing for sure was not grateful enough for the things I had, for mm. the things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me. And my dad was giving me an example because he's a volunteer. He's a medical doctor. He goes back and forth to African countries for the medical operations. And he was always telling me, one day I want to take you with me. I was like, oh, I don't want to come, you know, because you don't want to face any difficulties and stuff. At, at some point I was like, okay, I'll come. Then I registered with an NGO, hmm. like with the Turkish ministry. Then we went to Niger. This wow. was another thing, changed so many things in my life. You took a flight with like 50 people whom you don't know before, like haven't met before. People from like different backgrounds, like from different re re religions coming there for the purpose of helping people hmm. without getting paid at all. SubhanAllah. And you took a flight 10 hours from Istanbul hmm. to Niger arriving at Niger, waiting for a couple of hours. The, 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 the weather is like 40 degree, 45 degree. You are sweating like, you know, like the water everywhere. Yeah. And the main, the main journey is starting at that point, 25 hours of bus. <laughs> and the roads are not like That's highways, crazy. you know, it's like literally one way when one bus comes, when you see another bus coming is from the other side, you need to stop, go to the side, wait till they pass and oh you can. God. Like 25 hours is crazy and there is no AC in the bus. <sighs> and the roads are not like, it, it, you know, there are lots of bumps. Yeah. So it's like, it, you don't feel like you are in a bus. You feel like you are in more in like in a trampoline, like jumping, oh, wow. jumping up and down, up and know. down. Whatever you have in your stomach comes up and down. Like, you know, it's, it's very, basically it was like, it helps it teaches you how to be grateful for the things. Mm -hmm. You start appreciating the things, you take it for granted. Even in Turkey, when you're going, going on the highway, I was like, I wish I was in back in my country, traveling on the highway. Even if I'm in the bus, but I would be in the bus that which, which has a proper road. <laughs> yeah. And we went there for like 24, five hours almost. We arrived there. You see, by the way, for those who don't know, Niger is one of the poorest country in the world. Not Nigeria, Niger. People yeah. mostly confuse Niger. Nigeria is a wealthy country in Africa. Niger is very poor. And they lack of water, clean water especially. Mm. I'm also gonna tell another story about that. And when we arrive there, you know, because for people, you are hope. No matter you, yeah, where you're coming true. from. If you're coming there to treat them medically, you are hope for them. And I went there, children start, surrounding me start hugging me you know like it gives me like such a goosebump mm. i've never felt that way before in my life then i was like subhanallah these people don't even know me don't mm. even know us but they see like they just come and hug you 
and we stayed there for like 15 days. In that 15 days, I learned so many things. Once we were in in between the operation, I was managing the, the logistics of the operations and like preparing people for the operations, yeah. uh, pre-operations and post-operations stuff. I was dealing with those. And the area where our uh, medical doctors are having their tea and water is separated from the, the patients. They don't see each other because we have limited water and food as well. We don't want them to feel like, we're trying to also like, you know, serve them with the everyday the food is being cooked like proper meat like meals and stuff being served mm. but at the same point you don't want to show once you're having they they might not have a clean water yeah you, you you have another room so there was one uh doctor he was he finished his tea but his plastic uh, uh cup was outside he forgot it outside under the a AC, you know, the, the, the external part of the AC. From the medical room, there's a pipe going out, mm. the, the water is dripping. Well, wow. So there was a child, like four or five years old, who found this cup, went, uh, stay under the AC, wait for glass to be filled with the dirty water coming from the, the operation room. And we saw that guy, this, this child filled it up and was trying to, like people start crying. It was like something. They've never seen before. they never seen before. And this is not something we always take it for granted. Hmm. And that child was like trying to have a water. And this, like all these stories, you know, somehow like teach you how to be grateful. And I was, I realized that I was not grateful. And I had to learn a lot. We had to learn a lot, especially like, you know, because at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us so much blessings, like mm. so many ni'mas and stuff, which we are taking for granted. And another thing is, before I, I was a kind of person who was like, who likes, you know, showering, spending so much time and, and stuff, you like consuming lots of water. Mm. When I take a shower, it was like, it would take like one hour, sometimes two hours, relaxing, chilling. Now I'm taking just max five, 10 minutes, hmm. mostly like maximum five minutes. Some of my friends get surprised. Oh, it's like, it's better to consume less water unless you have another situation, but no need, you know, because hmm. when we were in Niger, we had a, like a small a plastic bottle like this and we have a like a pipe to fill it up and it's dripping. This amount of water, this amount of plastic bottle was filled up in a, like in a one minute or two. Yeah. So to take a shower, imagine you're waiting for this to fill up, then you use it, use shampoo, wait another one minute, take, and especially someone who's like, you know, who's very uh, obsessed with this stuff, mm. like, like comfort and back then, yeah. this, is, this was very hard. And man. the luxury for us was having another bottle. Because when you were using the first bottle, at least the second bottle at the same time was filling up. Yeah. So once the one's finished, you can use another one that at the same time you can fill it up again. But Alhamdulillah, that journey, I believe that brought so much things to learn. Mm. And Alhamdulillah, this was one of the, the places has a very big impact on my life. And Alhamdulillah, it gave me so many things that both like, you know, priceless, like, I can't measure it, like... Uh, hmm. Because it's crazy, like, what I'm <clears throat> thinking as well, like, because you always hear when you're growing up from, like, I'm sure you have as well, like, your parents saying, you should be grateful for this, you should be grateful for that, you know, in some other countries, they don't have A, B, and C, but then you have sometimes to go experience it, it's just a whole different level, because you're, you're putting yourself through those people's shoes, you're starting to understand that people actually live in these conditions. True. And that's like, it really hurts to hear, like imagine having to live in that sort of condition to clean yourself every day. And that's the norm, <clears throat> subhanAllah. But at some point it was good because it's taking you back to your roots mm. where there's not much technology. And at one point you learn how to survive, how to be, you know, on your own with the limited things, limited water, limited food. Mm. And another things I realized, and um, which is, the more thing you have, the less happiness you have. You have like the, the, the less happy you are. 
the more things you have the less happy you are the less things you have the more happy you are those children i met there May Allah bless them so, with so many goodness and blessings in their life, in the future. May Allah Amen. open their future, give them a bright future. Amen. They were like the happiest people I've ever met. But they, they didn't have much things. Hmm. Like maybe a house, if you would say house, I don't know. But modern tech, like the house, yeah. you can't even compare. They don't even know if they're going to find their food that day. Clean water, sometimes they're walking three, four kilometers hmm. to find the water, which is not even clean. But they were happy and they were enjoying their life and they were grateful. They were making lots of shukr, like praising Allah, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave us this. Hmm. Subhanallah, Allah is giving us like millions of blessings we take for granted. And sometimes we like, you know, sometimes overlook those blessings, even not saying Alhamdulillah. But Subhanallah, then I was like, we are not the, 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 the real grateful people. They are the real gratefuls. They are like literally being grateful for every single thing they have. Hang on a second. You're not subscribed. Can you do me a favor? Run that mouse or your finger to the bottom there. Click that subscribe button. Turn on that notification bell as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think when you see those amazing people, they teach you so many things. Yeah. Even if you don't want to learn, they teach you somehow. Yeah, subhanAllah. It shows you can you can learn from anyone without yeah. even realizing as well. It, it hurts to move on from this topic because it's so important. But I need to find so much more about these travel experiences because there's so much to hear about. I don't think we can get all of it done today. Inshallah, we'll have chats over the, the next Inshallah. day or so. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Inshallah. But from the top of your head, even if you can remember like just some other... <clears throat> other places other experiences that have impacted you today because there are a lot of places so i can't <coughs> get you to explain every single place yeah to be honest most of the countries or places you visit one thing if you are i i try not to travel with lots of money because i'm not a rich person hmm. and just trying to travel with a minimum budget Always having in people in each respective country helps you because somehow they somehow take care of you if you need something and stuff. But even if I go, if I can go back and had like million dollars travel with the like uh, with the best airlines, staying in five star hotels, I wouldn't want it because it wouldn't give me the experience I get. Hmm. And I don't like being like very touristy whenever I travel. I like trying to be local, going socializing with locals, trying to go on the like, you know, very empty streets, not very touristic streets, trying to explore the real scene. It gives you the real traveling vibe. And, and the most importantly, no matter where you travel, you always travel to yourself, to your heart. If you know how to make it, you can find yourself within yourself in a way. Hmm. It might sound a bit philosophical, I, but... I understand what you mean. Like, do you, so you mean like understand and find out more about yourself as you yeah. travel through different experiences and with like different places as well yeah. because you're put in certain uncomfortable situations and you don't know how you're going to react to it because it's so, it's so new to you. It's the first time. I'm certainly going through that in the past few weeks as well. So I think it is very interesting. Yeah, get, getting out of your comfort zone. Exactly. You might feel a bit uncomfortable, but yeah. this discomfort will bring lots of comfort in the future. Mm. Like, Espe especially like looking back at it, like maybe a, a few days after or even a week after, you look back at the experience and say, wow, that like that's something I really needed because you had to go through that experience to understand how grateful you are, for example, in your situation. Yeah. Yeah, subhanAllah. Okay, so <coughs> let's take this to another... What was your question like? I want to know another, like, <coughs> if you the, can think... The places you said, I Like that specific is. experiences that have impacted you the most, such as Niger. Niger, okay. Yeah. For me, uh, Mecca, Medina was a very nice experience. But recently, I have I visited... Palestine, mm. by the way, free Palestine, and 
Alhamdulillah, it was a great experience. But it was something, you know, among those different trips, this was also one of the best and unique one. Mm. Because I felt like I'm home. I was in a country where I don't speak the language. I don't know the people at all. It was the last 10 day of Ramadan. Then, you know, people are like very warm, very friendly. Every single Muslim you meet there. And maybe some of us was like, you know, they, we always grow up with like, like different news, like from media and stuff. We were a bit worried and scared to go and visit our land, our like, which was occupied by the occupation forces. Hmm. But Alhamdulillah, you have the faith and you go and all the doors are opening up. No matter what hmm. challenges you go, and it's not as ex exaggerated as you see in the media, because they don't want you to visit. But I believe that as Muslims, it is our duty to go and visit Palestine because in a way Palestine like is Yatim. We need to take care of Palestine. Mecca and Medina, those are holy places. But after you have done Hajj, your pilgrimage, if you have a chance to go to Umrah, be delayed a bit. Go to Jerusalem, Palestine, mm. Al-Quds, see that places, be there. If you are not there, if I'm not there, if our brothers and sisters are not there, some other people will take the place and they'll be taking our, you know, our like, it's a place where we should go and visit. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't leave alone because the first impression I got, it was not very touristic and I didn't see much Muslims. They're like tourists, I mean, like non-Palestinians. Mm. And where is these people like, you know, going to travel a lot all across the world, mm. going to holidays, five star hotels. Why not going to Palestine? You can still have your holiday mm. there, or you can visit your holy land. You can say, I'm there, I'm here. Palestine is not al alone. Mm. And every single thing, it was like I stayed like five, six days, but it was like a dream. When I go came back to Turkey, I felt like I think I woke up from a dream, which was wow. amazing, amazing. Mm. Every single thing, subhanAllah, yeah, and very smooth, you know. People are welcoming you. You're going for sahur, like, we couldn't even spend money, you know. We went to a place, our friend hosted us for all trip. MashaAllah. We didn't pay for accommodation. We went to pray in the pray in Al-Aqsa. People are serving you lots of food. I'm not talking about just dates and milk like small food. The proper food, like especially mansaf, kapsa, like lots of mm. Arab food. You know, also Arab dishes are very course, delicious. Yes. As we have like regularly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. One of my favorites was Arab food. And everyone is bringing lots of food, serving you. You eat, they give you kunafas, like desserts, mm. sweets. You finish, you pray tarawi, you get to know one another with locals. You know, you go visit local shops, they give you gifts and stuff. It's not they try to sell you. It's not like they try to sell you something, like try to give you. Sometimes they literally give you for free. Mashallah. Like they want, because they are grateful that you are visiting the land. Mm. They're, they're happy to see non-Palestinians are coming and visiting Palestine. Other Muslims around the Other world. Other Muslims around the world mm. are aware of Palestine and know how important it is for us, for Muslims. Mm. And, f you know, for Sahur, for Iftar, like everyone is serving food and stuff. You feel like you have a very big family. And of course, in front of Al-Qubatu Sahra, this is amazing. I think it's like, it's one of the best experience I have had so far and Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. and I made an intention inshallah if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me health wise and the financially like enough I'm, I made an intention to go every year the last 10 day of Ramadan inshallah. inshallah and I encourage whoever is gonna watch this encourage them to at least feel how important Palestine for us mm. and try to find a way to go visit our lovely land and feel this, especially if they go in Ramadan, that will be amazing as well. And spending the Eid is there is like the one of the best Eid ever. I was away mm. from family. If my family watched this video, they might get a bit upset, but it was the best Eid in my life, even though I was away from my family. I was with a bigger family, the biggest mm. family, Alhamdulillah.
That's beautiful. Alhamdulillah, I have got the chance to go as well. So I'm understanding everything you're explaining and it's really warming my heart. And I think a lot of people maybe have this misconception of entering Palestine or traveling to there, the difficulty and also maybe going like going past the border that it's not something they want to do because like, like we said before, it's uncomfortable. So people don't want to go through an uncomfortable situation. They just want an easy travel. But then what people have to understand is when they go through all the uncomfortable part of the trip, which is the start only, you forget about everything. Once you see Laksa, once you see, you know, the old, old city, you're just falling in love. Like you completely forget about all the trouble. And that's kind of just like what a lot of things are. When Once it's all done, most... Um, uncomfortable situations, you look back and you kind of forget about it. Yeah. It's like it's all worth it. True. But alhamdulillah, yeah, there is a lot of sweetness in that city. And this, this misconception should be, I think, somehow uh, should be changed the other way around. Like, I mean, we shouldn't be worried to go at the end of the day, no matter how hard it is. Like, at the end of the day, it's not like you're going there, they are like threatening you with the guns exactly. and stuff. No, it's very welcoming mm -hmm. for those who don't know, by the way, it's very welcoming. This is a like very, very smart strategy they apply. They yeah. want you to have a like very well, they, they welcome you in a way. They just try to prolong the process for you, searching your back, this, but they're still smiling at your face, this fake smilings and stuff. Oh, yeah. But Alhamdulillah, at the end of the day, you know, you have nothing to hide. You have nothing to hide, exactly. literally. Yeah. And you, 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 don't, you don't do anything wrong and you're going to visit your own mm. land. And once you also have the faith, Alhamdulillah, even the difficulty is becoming ease. Mm. No, I like that. I do completely agree with that advice. I think all Muslims have to have the opportunity in their life, inshallah, if Allah wills, to go visit Jerusalem. I think it is a very similar feeling when going to Mecca and Medina. Very similar, mashallah. Okay, so let's talk about, I want to know, I don't know if Niger is the most difficult experience of all your travels. Is it yes or no? Uh, no. Because <laughs> this is what I want to find out. Yes. I want to find out the top of the tree, the most difficult situation, <laughs> even if you have more than one. But let's start with one. Okay, so the Niger is, you know, it's like an iceberg. It's what you see. Yeah. There's more what you don't see under the... Subhanallah, <laughs> here basically. we go. And, and it is something you... Niger was something we knew beforehand we traveled because we knew the difficulty was waiting for us. Yeah. We accept the reality and we went. One of the stories happened when I was in, I think in 2019, I was in Prague, Czech Republic. Yeah. And it was after 12 o'clock, we were trying to find the hotel. Then I went to market to buy some stuff. And I like this, you know, in Turkey, back then we didn't have this e-scooters. I was mm. like, oh, let me use it. I download the app. I totally forgot I have like 20% battery. I use it. I went to place. I'm exploring the city. And it was, I think, like one o'clock or something. My friend and I was going to go back together. And he was like, okay, then I'm going. I'm very tired, he said. I was like, okay, you can go. I don't know why I said that, but let me use the scooter. I'll come back. I drove a bit. Then I checked the navigation and I saw the batteries notifying me low power, 5% left, like literally. I knew before it was low, but not that low. I was like, first of all, how, how can I get to, to the place I stay? And the problem, I also don't have the keys. Long story short, my battery is that. I have a scooter under my name. I don't have a phone to return the scooter. Hmm. I don't have the address. I know one way, but I have a scooter and it's, it was almost two o'clock and my friend went. Subhanallah, you know, I was like, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I start driving all around the city from one, point to another, trying to find where I'm staying. I found a petrol station. <coughs> I found a petrol station. I remember, oh, this was close to the place because from the map and stuff, I remember. And also we were passing by the place first. I, I remember how it looks like. Somehow I managed to find this place. It was like almost four o'clock. I found the place and I was waiting in front of the building, but the building, the, the outside, outside door was closed and mm. there's no bell or something 
Wow. It's just with your card you can open, mm. and there's no security because we we rent it through Airbnb, and there is one place, small office, the one who is renting the places mm. are opening his office at nine o'clock or something, and it is four o'clock. I don't have phone. I have a scooter with me that I need to take care of. I don't know how I'm gonna get in and it's so cold outside. Then literally, I was like, okay, let me try to stay calm. What I can do now? Either I'm just gonna wait next to my scooter so they wouldn't steal my scooter, which is not gonna cause another problem for me in a foreign country mm. that I don't even know first time. I waited. People are passing by. It was like, I think, 5.30. Couple of people start passing by, maybe going to work and stuff. I tried to ask them, even though I was wearing like, you know, like very casual clothes, like, it, to be honest, I, I didn't look like, uh, like I'm homeless or like I'm someone who has a bit bad intention. Then I saw people start ignoring me, not even looking at my face, just passing by. And then I, I pull, up, pull up my passport just to show them, look, I'm tourist, I have my passport, my battery died. They don't care about me. They come pass by, come pass mm. by. Like so many people. I literally feel like in the movies, you know, like wow. they don't care about you. They don't know, like mm. maybe they don't trust you. Maybe they feel a bit like, you know, insecure, yeah. but they don't help you. They didn't help. I waited till 7.30. It was around 7.30 and I was like, okay, I hope I'm not gonna get sick. You know, like it was cold, cold. And I couldn't even charge my phone. I don't have my friend's number or anything. What I can do, what I can do, I think. There was one brother passing by. <clears throat> He's also, I think, from Czech Republic. There was a one bakery next to the place and he was bringing, I think, some bakery stuff to the place. Yeah. Then I was like, I didn't have any hope, but I was like, let me ask him, you know, maybe he can help me. I asked him, luckily he came. He was like, okay what i can do i was like can you please call this guy his number is written there because i don't have my phone can you just tell him this guy muhammad is get he's stuck outside he needs to get in or if he can call my friend it's just one button they're gonna open the door and i'll get in hmm. i was like okay he called the guy he didn't respond i was like he called again he called again he trying to help me mashallah hmm. After three or four time, the guy responded. He was like, oh, okay, tell him to wait till nine o'clock. I had been waiting since two o'clock at night. Like another three hours I'm gonna wait. It's impossible, I'm gonna die. And he, mm. sorry, like literally it's super cold and I didn't have food or stuff. And he was like, okay, uh, give me your friends, like call your friend. I was like, I don't have my battery. Okay, I'll give you, like you can, you know, charge your phone, power bank and stuff. Are you sure? Yes, yes. And, but my friend number is Turkish number. So it's, you need to use your roaming. It's gonna charge you. He was like, no problem. Call your friend. Literally, I type his number, dial, my friend pick up. Uh, I just say, for God's sake, please open the door. I'm outside. And he was like, okay, I'm opening. And in a couple of minutes buzzing and the door is open. That's all you needed. That's all Two I needed. Two second phone call. Then That's luckily horrible. I charged my phone. So I left the, the e-scooter. Mm. Alhamdulillah, it was not stolen, but it was very stressful. And I was just 19 years old. I think mm. like 20 years old or something back then. And one of the, one of my first times in abroad as well. Anyways, long story short, I was like so grateful to the guy. And I, by the way, show him my passport. When he called the guy, owner of mm. the place, he said, oh, the guy from Turkey, Mohammed Sumbul, is waiting here. When he said, the guy said, oh, tell him to wait nine o'clock. Mm. Anyways, he knows my name is Mohammed. So basically he knows I'm Muslim. When he was leaving, I said, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. And he just say, no problem. He just turned, look at me and say, Assalamu Alaikum. <laughs> I was like, I had goosebumps, wow. literally. I was like, subhanallah. Uh, maybe that guy was Muslim, but he just turned, look at my eyes, smile at me at seven, eight o'clock in the morning and help me without expecting anything. Yeah. And just say, assalamu alaikum. Even if he wasn't, it, that mean, it just, it seems like that interaction, he has a good impression yeah. of Muslims. So alhamdulillah, that's a very good sign. Alhamdulillah. You know, like, yeah. Now, when I, when I, whenever I remember this guy, I don't even remember who, how he looks like. Hmm. But 
may Allah, may Allah guide him, may Allah bless him with so many Amen. blessings. This is something I, I can never forget. And yeah. it was a very hard day for me. Yeah. And after that, I always start carrying Pablo Bank with me all the time. Mm. And like at least <laughs> writing my uh, friend's number or the first emergency contact to somewhere that I can reach out. Yeah. Just in case I need. But Alhamdulillah. But see, you don't think of doing those things only until you go through a situation where you need to. True. So that's why like, mm. it's good that we're talking about your travel experiences and other t I'll get other chances to talk about mine in other episodes inshallah in the future but the point of sharing our experiences for other people is to show <coughs> that um, you know to have trust in Allah in certain scenarios in your life whether it is traveling or whether you're just at home you know looking for a job or whatever it is you should always have trust in Allah and that he knows you better than you know yourself true so like when you are sometimes stressing about what's going to happen you're uncomfortable you don't know the future it's all unknown to you but that's where you need the patience and inshallah things will work out for you yeah inshallah and all the hardship you know once you travel all the hardship once they find you you find yourself and mm. you find allah within your heart yeah basically because as, as he subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, like, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ So, wherever you are, he's with you. And especially when you are not surrounded with people, absence of people helps you to feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart. Yeah. You feel it more. And you feel like he's the only one now with you. Yeah. And which is make it, makes it harder and feel like more connected if you can. And when you have sincere trust with Allah, that's where all the warmth comes to your heart. Like I'll tell you a quick story of mine. Sure. When I was in Copenhagen, I was maybe two weeks into my travels like alone. And this is where the time where you start to think, oh, can I even do this? Is this even for me? I start doubting myself lots of like, because you're by yourself. It feels lonely sometimes, right? True. So I went out for dinner. I looked for like, I was like, Bismillah, let's find halal food near me. So then I found a burger place. And this by this time, like, because it's in Denmark, like, there's not many Muslims, True. right? So then I, I went to this burger place. It was a Muslim, happened to be a Muslim place as well. And I spoke to the brother, and he was a bit curious. So he asked me where I'm from and stuff because I don't look local. And then I start speaking to him, telling my situation, and he starts like being very supportive, and he understands. He's like, "This is what I love to see. Like, I want to see more people doing this because they learn a lot from travels, especially by themselves." And he also, they came to a point where, because first of all, when I went into the shop, it was quiet. No one was there. So I was a bit unsure about the situation. So at the end of the meal, I ate, I spoke to him as well. He even sat down for a bit, Muslim guy. And he's like, oh no, you can't pay. I'm not gonna let you pay. He's like, this one's for me. He's like, "My, the brotherhood that we created is more important to me than money. And he's like, he gives me his card and he's like, whatever you need, whether you're in Copenhagen or not, or Spain, because I told him my trip, call me and I'll help you. If you need money, I'll help you. And like, subhanAllah, like this is like, it's, I can't, I don't even know how to explain it. Like how I feel about this situation. Like it's, it's amazing how Muslims can help you out and like, the sort of, like I'm lost for words to be honest, because it's such a like crazy story to hear how it even happened and it shows that Allah's plan is like greater than anything else True. so uh, and at the end like all Muslims are brothers exactly yeah so alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. same as this interaction alhamdulillah Some, something similar reminded me of my story it happened once like similar when I was in England first time currency is very expensive I went to shop to have some groceries and stuff. It was like 40 or 50 pounds, something I was about to pay. And the Imam of the Masjid was in the same market with me. Hmm. And we, he just know I came from Turkey, a Muslim guy there, just arrived first week there. He, he was like, he tried to come and he was about to pay mine. I was like, wow. no, no, please. I was like, no, no, please. You are a guest. And like, you know, you just arrived. I was like, SubhanAllah, you know, like this, it's wherever, amazing. wherever you go, like literally, Alhamdulillah, we have this, this brotherhood, this sisterhood all around the world. Mm. Like, you know, the sincerity from the sincere Muslims. And subhanAllah, I'm just looking at back. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, He wants something, He can transform you any way He wants. <clears throat> and you, you might become a different personality over years. Hmm. If, if, I, if, if, if I was told that my personality is going to be like this today, I'm not saying it is good or bad today. May Allah guide us to straight path. Amen. But I wouldn't have been able to know, imagine myself like this today. And I'm sure five years later, maybe I'm imagining myself somewhere if Allah gives me life. Maybe the way I imagine myself is not gonna be the same way Allah is gonna give me. Hmm. Like, I don't know. There was a, like one 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 short things I wanted to say. Like you also beforehand we we discuss, like we spoke about these things before. I remember I recall one of our conversations. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He created us in different tribes, in different colors, different cultures. So we get to know one another. Hmm. Literally, there is such a barakah in this. This ayah always remind us there is a diversity, but there is a unity within this diversity. Hmm. And once you find this unity, you find the one. Everything goes to the one and you find yourself. Alhamdulillah, you know, like, I'm, I'm so grateful for the things we have as Muslims, as international Muslims, hmm. as we say being connected with one another from Europe to Asia, from Australia to America, all these countries and continents. And it's always good to be connected. And subhanAllah, now me and you sitting, like to one Australian brother, one Turkish brother, no, originally amazing. not neither Australians or nor Turkish ones, yeah. but staying in one room, having a podcast, trying to reach out to the other brothers and sisters in the, mm. in the world. And Alhamdulillah, you know, like I, this is this is such a blessing, and yes, yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, yeah. And just for people to know that we met at Azahra, yeah. So we'll be, inshallah, send, like putting a link in about Azahra as well and what it's about. So we met volunteering there. So it's not just like, oh, yeah. how did these brothers be? Yeah. Like it's so random, True. like in Granada, Spain. Alhamdulillah. So with these travel experiences, mashallah. We could be talking about these for weeks, right? So we're going to move on. Alhamdulillah, these experiences are life-changing. But then also you're part of this program now that you've told me in Istanbul briefly. I would like you to explain a bit more <clears throat> and tell everyone else what this organization is about. Um, mm, I've, I've been living in Istanbul past seven years. Mm. And we have a Muslim community in Istanbul international Muslims expats in Istanbul and like we have like three four thousand people alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah and we have an collective called Istanbul Muslim Collective and Istanbul Youth Academy it is a place for Muslims especially for youth where they can develop yourself develop themselves like spiritually intellectually where they can find a nice space to, to, to get to know each other, also to socialize, to, you know, to be connected. All these internationals from like, from Asia to Europe, from America to Africa. We have like different from, from like different people from different backgrounds, different mm. countries. Uh, we are trying to have like from, you know, academical works to social works, like organizations, camps, picnics, hikes or like academic events to sohbaz lectures or like whenever we have shiuks coming to Istanbul scholars we are inviting them organizing some stuff and uh, we, we also trying to network with different Muslims all around the world so if anyone needs anything from community they can get to like get, they can reach out to someone from mm. other countries so creating a kind of a network program like a network for, for Muslim youth. MashaAllah, I think that's very good to hear because now it's it's exciting to see now, inshallah, like like we're talking about before, Muslims all around the world, because lots of people are traveling to Istanbul recently. I did as well, alhamdulillah. If we get to go again or for the first time, we can come to this youth inshallah. organization and take part, inshallah. Whenever they come or you come, more than welcome. Uh, as we say in Turkish, başımızın üstünde yeriniz var. Like you have a place on top of our head, as our, okay. they say in Arabic, ala rasi. Yeah, ala rasi, yeah. So yeah, they can reach out to reach out 
to us through social media accounts. Now, like we use, like we are merging two communities, but okay. Istanbul Muslim Collective and Istanbul Youth Academy, Facebook, Instagram, other channels. So our social media friends will give the enough information and we would love to uh, host them in Istanbul, show them around with the community. And it will be a good experience, inshallah. Also, I would love for you to tell everyone your Instagram because I'd love for people to see your travel experiences past and future inshallah uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just I uh, I can share with the with you so you can tag inshallah perfect, perfect no problem whatever is uh, easier for you it, it might be easy maybe okay I try to recently share just my photo like uh, travel photography I'm yeah. more interested in photography but rather than just sharing personal good, pictures Photography can go a long way. It can explain a lot of things, alhamdulillah. So That's nice. It's a kind of way also. When you combine traveling mm. with photography, it's becoming a like, an li life-changing experience. Yeah, it's true. So just before we conclude, do you have any last <coughs> words or advice you'd like to give or anything I've missed? Bismillah, like if you have anything I've missed to explain or even talk about. I mean... Uh, each one of us like you know trying to somehow we both of us, both of us are here mm. trying to explore our explore our worlds yeah. in different ways so i i want to conclude it with a dua that may allah give us the sincerity whatever we do so because all the intentions or all the old actions are upon like intention so if, if our intentions is not clean so it doesn't make sense at all true because if I, if i personally cannot correct my intention and i cannot correct myself and if i cannot correct myself how would i expect people to be correct themselves like how, how would i expect them to correct themselves mm. as well and i think the sincerity is the most important for us as muslims renewing intentions let's say not sincerity sorry like renewing intentions because wherever like we go this i think in most muslim countries this is always the the topic of the lectures right mm. renewing the intention having a good intention even yes. when you are praying or you are doing community works or you are traveling or like maybe trying to sometimes like trying to know trying to humble ourselves that at the end of the day sorry we are nothing and 70 years old like people the average life is 70 years hmm. and we almost spent 30 years max we have maybe 40 years yes, we're gonna be no one after 40 years everyone will forget us let's say 100 years later two generations after except the good deeds we do with sincerity and no matter how big things you achieved how successful you are how many languages you learn how many countries you visited how many people's like you you know you, you change life like how many people's life you changed hmm. doesn't matter everything will be on allah's you know side like no one will know hmm. that's why true whatever we do may allah give us the sincerity and good intention to do for his sake and may allah gather us as he gathered us here today may allah gather us mm. in the day of judgment under the shade of his under his shade and with the prophet sallallahu and yeah it was a very nice conversation i don't feel like i don't want to feel like i'm hosting you i don't no, want to no, talk too perfect. much no wallah barakallah honestly that dua is probably the best way to finish this interview bro I'll be, I, pref I Just honestly like appreciate there. you coming on. It's been beautiful. Like you, you accepted the offer, alhamdulillah. It's my pleasure, alhamdulillah. Yeah. It's my pleasure. At the end of the day, uh, it's it's not the, the the speech we gave. If as long as we speak the the like the, 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 the word of Allah, hmm. you know, because these are His words, like the the ayahs and things we give as an example. Because at the end of the day, what we speak is will be forgotten. But what he told us, what he sends us, always will be remembered. Hmm. And you, me, will be going, changing. But the word of Allah will stay. And inshallah, uh, I hope that will be like, Alhamdulillah, this conversation, I benefit a lot from the conversation with you. Hmm. I, I, I had so many things to take away with me. So I learned so many things from this conversation. May it be beneficial for those who listen to this conversation as well. 
and barak Allah fiq inshallah mashallah you're a top brother <laughs> all right all the best inshallah your travels tomorrow and inshallah we'll get yeah, to meet inshallah. soon in the future jazakallah khair yalla assalamu alaikum alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah